Okay, uh, this is Ben Knight. Good morning, good afternoon to all of you. There's such a fantastic range of attendees, participants uh, in this webinar. Uh, it's, it's quite amazing. I'm very happy, very privileged to be talking to you all. Uh, I've noticed people from Morocco to Philippines to China, from Ukraine down to Kenya, Senegal, and then every country in between, uh, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, uh, Dubai, Oman, Lebanon, India, Pakistan. So it's a fantastic range of people and it's wonderful for us to get together as a community of teachers and educationalists uh, from around the world. So uh, what I want to talk to you today about is life competencies taught through ELT. And if you're not sure what that means, don't worry, I'm going to take you through it step by step. But I want to start off, first of all, with the very general question. And this is a question that we ask ourselves a lot. Why do people, teachers, sorry, parents and students invest so much time and effort and money in learning English? Why is learning English so important to them? Is it because that they expect or want to travel to an English speaking country? Well, in most cases, that's not the case. That's not what they're thinking. In fact, it's quite often that people who are learning English don't expect, or people who encourage their children to learn English, don't really expect them to be speaking to anyone whose first language is English. So it's not to do with that. What we've found talking to a lot of parents is that it's more to do with their engagement with the world around them. It's part of a set of skills that they see their children needing to become international citizens of the future. That's what they want their children to become, to be able to engage with the world around them, to be able to take information and ideas from other places, to be able to express their own ideas and their own views and feelings and share their own culture with other people around the world. And to just to share things which bring pleasure as well. So it's really part of a set of skills which are needed to engage with the world. And we see this, for example, if you think of this person, do, do you recognize who this person is? Some of you will recognize her as Greta Thunberg, and she's from Sweden. And I took a picture here of a presentation she was giving in Poland. And so she's Swedish, she's speaking to people from Poland, from around Europe, very few of them speak English as a first language, but they're using English, she's using English in order to communicate to a wider audience. But it's not just that she's able to speak English. If we look at the way that she expresses it, it's very carefully crafted. It's very, she's got a complicated idea and she's expressed it very clearly. We have run out of excuses and we're running out of time, change is coming. So being able to use English is not just about grammar and vocabulary, but it's being able to express ideas in a way that people will listen. What I want you to do now is to think of a particular child. Think of a child that you know and that you like, that you care about. It could be a child, it could be your own child. It could be a child of a uh, brother or sister, it could be a um, someone in your family, or it, be, it might be a child that you teach. But I want you to think of one particular child. And then I want you to write the name of that child. You can write it in the chat box, or you can write it on a piece of paper next to you. But I want you to write down the name of that child who is in your mind, some child that you care about. Let me just have a look at the chat box and see if you, anybody is doing this. Yeah. Can you see okay. the chat box, Ben? You can see yeah, it, can you? Yeah, okay, it, just, it took a little while to catch up with it. Okay. So I can see it now and I can see uh, people writing the names and that's fantastic, great. So then I want you to think about that child and the fact that 
they will probably go through 12 years of education school. They go to school every day, they have to do homework, they attend lessons for 12 years. And at the end of those 12 years, what do you really want that child to get out of their education? Those 12 years of going to school and coming back, maybe going to college, what do you want them to get out of all that education? What would make you happy about their education? Now I'm going to come back to that. You think about it now, and then I'm going to come back to that. Now we've asked lots of parents, we've looked at this question, what is it that matters most in education? And one of the things that we find is that when we ask parents, of course, one of the things they want from education is that child gets qualifications. They get the academic results they need. And this is important because qualifications give you more choices in life. They give you more options and parents want that for their children. So as teachers, it's important for us to deliver those results. But they don't just want that. They don't want their children to become, whoops, they don't want their children to become exam taking machines. They want them to come out as a whole child with their whole personality and other skills developed as well. So when you ask and try and find out what do people really want, one of the things they want, they tell us, is that they want their child to be able to work with others, to get on with others, to be, to be effective in a group. And we can describe this as collaboration. And particularly these days, there's an there's a increasing need for us and for our children to be able to work together, not just in an isolated way. Another thing that parents talk about is the importance of learning skills because at the heart of all our education is the ability to learn. And some children are really good at learning and some find it difficult. So just the ability to learn, those learning skills and strategies are a core thing that we need to deliver in education. And that's partly because we continue to learn throughout our lives. Those days when we could just get an education, a qualification, and then do the same job for the rest of our lives, those have gone. Now we're constantly developing and learning new things, not just technology, but also different types of skills, different ways of engaging with people. Even just in these last few months, all of us have had to learn how to do things online, which we'd never done before. So learning to learn is a core skill. Another thing which is very true these days with the internet is the ability to think critically about what we hear and what we read. We know there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of different opinions and ideas and information, and a lot of it is unreliable. So how do we help our children to become good at recognizing what they can trust and what they can't trust, how they can critically evaluate what they hear and read? So critical thinking is another of those skills. Another thing is that parents say is they don't want their children to lose all their imagination and creativity, their ability to have fun. They want them to use their imagination. And imagination is really important even for us as adults, because imagination is the way that we solve problems. When we have a problem, we need the imagination to think outside the way that we've been thinking about it before. And so imagination is a key part of problem solving. Another thing that parents often say they want is that their children become good at communicating, that they're good at getting their idea across, that they're good at managing how they participate in a meeting. And also if they have to stand up in front of a crowd of people, that they are able to speak out with confidence and clarity. So these are essential communication skills. And then finally, the last area I want to mention is this area of children having a sense of how they can contribute to the group, to the social group, to the society they're in, how they can be a force for good in that social group. And 
we talk about that as social responsibilities, a sense of your rights and responsibilities as part of maybe a family group or social group or, or even the country as a citizen. So there are six things that I've mentioned here. And these are things which parents tell us are important to them for their children. But there are also things which from research we know are important for the overall learning process. We learn more effectively in our subjects when we work well together with others, when we think critically, when we develop learning strategies, when we use creative thinking, when we communicate well, and when we work as part of a social group. Those skills are important just for our subjects, but they're also what parents want from the education system that we are responsible for. So I want you to come back to, uh, oops, sorry, that picture is slightly uh, misaligned, but I want you to think back to the child that you were thinking of that you named about five minutes ago. And I want you to think, what do you want for that child as they come out of their 12 years of education? So I'm going to look at the chat box and see what you're saying. I'm just, I'm just updating the chat box just to see your comments. So people have talked about 21st century skills and you're right, that's the kind of thing that I've been talking about. I'm going to talk about terminology in a minute. So if you have any other ideas, things that you think are important, uh, do share them on the chat box that you would like your children to have. Oops, messages coming through thick and fast. Okay. To be a genius, to be a doctor. Uh, well, that's very, that's, yeah, that's very focused, independent, um, sincere and creative confident, self-reliant, socially conscious. So these are lots of really good ideas, just a good human being. And of course, that, that's absolutely true. The ability to face changes. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting ideas coming through here. And a lot of it is knowledge, creativity, good communicator, character, very interesting, employability skills. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, kind of joining in there. I'm gonna move back now to the presentation. So there I was talking about school, but also school is partly about preparing people for university and we want our students, our children to do well at university. So what is it that they need in order to succeed at university? And so we've, we were looking at some uh, university sites and I've chosen one university at random here. Ah, University of Cambridge, that's interesting. So this university, of course, very uh, high standards, and they've put on their website the skills which successful students at Cambridge tend to display, tend to show. And let me just show you. They've put them in four groups, intellectual skills, communication skills, organization skills, and interpersonal skills. And if you look at that, you can see this is quite similar to the six that I was mentioning earlier. There's intellectual skills, is critical thinking and problem solving, communication skills we talked about, um, and organization skills is really learning to learn practical stuff. And then interpersonal skills is very much that collaboration together. So you can see we're talking similar kinds of essential skills. What about work? What skills do you actually need to, to get a job? Because we all want that for our children, that they have a career that they want. Well, if we look at the research into this, well, one of the things, first of all, to mention is that we don't know really what our students' futures will be. And that's because the world of work is changing so fast that you can't just train them for a job. They need to be trained with skills that will help them with a changing employment future. And just as an illustration of this, um, I want you to think about jobs that didn't exist when you were at school, but are now, uh, they now exist. Uh, for me, because I was at school a long time ago, that's there are hundreds of new jobs. Um, but for some of you who are younger, that may not be such a difference. But let me, again, let me have a look at your 
chats, are there any jobs there that you are uh, thinking of? There's so many of you on this call that uh, it takes a little while for the chat room to catch up when I ask you, but uh, it'll catch up a little bit in a minute. Usually when I ask people that, yeah, digital market blogger. Yeah, of course, that's very, very new. Online teaching, that's true, suddenly become big. So often di online digital things are, are the new things. Well, I did a little bit of research to see in the UK, what are the newest jobs that are coming up and um, which are growing fast. And I found these eight, which I thought were really interesting. Lifestyle auditor, robotics engineer, aging solutions consultant, traffic flow analyst, drone standard specialists, 3D, 3D food printer chef. I mean, I love that. Cryptocurrency banker, that's about Bitcoin kind of stuff. And then my favorite job, school designer. Who wouldn't love that job? So these are kind of, so really the point is that we don't know what our students' futures are. So we have to think of more general skills which they could bring to any job, whatever the future. Now, when we look at research into what employers ask for, of course, they want technical skills for their particular job. But the 10 most common skills that they ask for are, first of all, the ability to work in a team structure. We talked about collaboration before. Ability to make decisions and solve problems, which is around critical thinking. Communication, planning, prioritizing work, which is a learning to learn skill. Obtaining processing information, analyzing data, critical thinking, technical knowledge, proficiency with computers, writing reports, it's communication skill, and ability to sell and influence others. Again, a type of uh, communication skill. So we're seeing the same kind of skills come up. And if we look at research in Europe about how job skill requirements have changed. This is, this is looking at advertisements and job descriptions over the last 50 years, 60, well, 60 years now. You can see that there is a growth. There's a decline in the number of jobs which are requiring routine manual, routine cognitive uh, skills. That's doing certain processes over and over again and increasing demand for skills which are non-routine, so unpredictable interaction with people or non-predictable, non-routine analysis of information and data. So we, uh, our students now are moving into jobs which are much more unpredictable and require more generic skills than in the past. So we can see the world is changing, but is the education system changing to suit this changing world and this picture on the right says our school system was designed in 1893 i think that's an exaggeration of course we are changing our education systems but it still is a challenge to us in education are we really preparing our students for the future that they face and so if you had time i don't i don't want to spend too much on time on this because i want to capture other things but here are three questions that i would ask myself do you try to develop these skills among your students? Which ones and how? But I'm going to move on. And what I want to talk now, someone mentioned 21st century skills. And that's true because these kind of skills that I'm talking about are the kind of skills that get called 21st century skills there, or they get called life skills. But part of the problem is there are lots of different names and models for these skills and it can be confusing. There's global competency as well, social and emotional learning, employability skills, somebody mentioned that, growth mindset, college and career standards, um, the whole child, positive psychology, grit. So all of these are different ways about of talking about these skills. And one of the things we found when we were talking to teachers was that they were finding this confusing. What is the difference between life skills and employability? What, how does social emotional learning fit into this? How do they all connect? And that's why we decided we would step back and try to analyze what are the different skills we're talking about and how do they relate to each other? So we decided to create a framework. 
And that framework has three features. First of all, we wanted to put all these skills into one system so that you could see the relationship between them. You could see what's the relationship between collaboration and communication. What's the difference between creative thinking and critical thinking? So they all need to be in one system. Secondly, we need to show how those skills develop across the skills of learning. What does critical thinking look like at primary uh, school? What do communication skills look like at university? What does emotional development look like at secondary? So we need to show how each of those skills develop through the whole education process. And thirdly, we wanted a framework which had detail, which could show teachers what those skills actually looked like in the classroom. Because sometimes when we talk about these skills, it sounds a bit abstract. If we say creative thinking, well, what, what does that really mean? As a teacher, how do you know if your child, the children you're teaching, are developing creative thinking skills? It's quite difficult because it's abstract. So we wanted to make it as concrete and as clear as possible in terms of detail. So this is the framework. These are the three features of the framework that we developed. Now, at the top level of the framework, it's quite simple. There's a six areas that we talked about uh, earlier. We also realized that Underneath those six areas, there are three important types of skill. There's the development of our emotional management and intelligence. There's our ability to use digital tools. And there's discipline knowledge. That means subject knowledge. So you need to know your subject, whether it's science or, or history, uh, etc. But the six skills at the top are the main focus. Now that, sorry. Let me just go down. That top there is not particularly different. It's quite similar to other models that you've seen. But where the Cambridge framework becomes more interesting is when we go into more detail. So for example, when we talk about creative thinking, we've broken that down into three core areas, participating in creative activities, creating new content from your own ideas or other resources, and then thirdly, using new content to solve problems and make decisions. And similarly, for the other areas, we've broken them down into core areas. And this helps you to think, what is it that we really need to develop in each of our students? So when we talk about collaboration, for example, it's not just working together, it's, it's four different core areas. It's about each person taking responsibility for their contribution. It's about listening respectfully and responding constructively to others. It's about managing the sharing of tasks. And it's about working together towards a resolution for the task. So at the top level, we got six, and then we've got 20 core areas within that. Then we want to think about how do those develop? And so we divided the learning journey into five major stages, pre-primary or kindergarten, primary, secondary, higher education, and at work, because we still continue to learn when we're at work. And so what we've done is we've taken those different skills, and then we have shown how each of them develops across the learning journey. And now how do we link up the skills and the stages of learning. Well, this is where we use can-do statements. Statements, these are descriptions of what our students can do at each stage for each of the skills areas. Now, I'm going to give you some examples just to clarify what I mean by that. Let's, this is the overall framework. And if we take one of those, let's say um, from collaboration, listening respectfully and responding constructively to others' contributions. Let's look at the can-do statements for that core area. So if we think of pre-primary, when we, in what ways, what behaviours could pre-primary students demonstrate that they are listening respectfully and responding constructively to others' contributions? Well, they allow others to finish speaking before they share their own ideas or they extend and elaborate play ideas, for example, 
building up a role play with other children. So those are clear behaviors that children can demonstrate at pre-primary to show how they're developing this particular collaboration skill. Then if we take that to primary, so this is up to the age of say 10 or 11 years old, what would we expect from a primary school student? Well, that they're able to focus on the content of group talk from start to finish, that they're able to interrupt politely, and that they can respond positively to what others say about the group task they are doing. What about secondary? So up to the age of say 15, 16, 15, 16, 17. Well, they should be able to acknowledge others' ideas positively. They should be able to give their opinion on other students' contributions respectfully. And they should be able to build on other students' uh, contributions by adding examples or further related ideas. What about higher education? Well, in at that level, we would expect them to be able to respond in an open-minded way to different ideas, including those which represent an opposing point of view, and to be able to acknowledge other points of view before presenting a counter-argument. And at work, interrupt others when speaking, politely acknowledge contribution of others in a meeting. So these are all, each of these sentences, phrases is a can-do statement. It describes the actual behavior of someone who is developing those skills successfully at that stage of their education. So I hope you have got the idea that you understand it. And now I've got a little task, a little quiz for you. Uh, what I've got is I've got six can-do statements here. And they're part of this grid for the six different uh, skills and the five different stages of learning. But the can-do statements are in the wrong place. So I want you to decide which box should they go into. Let me do the first one as an example so that you understand what I'm asking. So finds sources of information and help online or in school. Now, what kind of skill is that? I think that's something to do with learning to learn. It's a learning skill. And it's true, it could be at different stages, but it feels to me that's, that that's really a secondary school thing being able to find information on your own and help. So let's just see if that's, uh, if I, I hope I'm right. Phew, I am, good. So that was learning to learn secondary. Can you do the same for the others? For number two, three, four, five, and six, I'll give you, I'm not gonna give you too long because I don't wanna spend, waste. Uh, no, I want, don't wanna use up too much of my time here. But if we say about uh, two minutes, to just try and work out where do the other can-do statements go and put them in the chat box. Okay, some of you are really quick. Now, one of the things I would say is that sometimes the answer is not black and white, that a lot of these skills link to each other. Communication may have an element of collaboration and something which is about um, learning to learn might have a bit of critical thinking. So sometimes the edges are a bit fuzzy. And in the same way, the difference between the stages of education are not clear cut. So something which you need to learn at primary, you probably also need to learn at secondary. And we all know people who never learn any of these skills even when they're at work. So um, they're, they're a, it's a bit fuzzy at the edges about exactly which one you would put it in. But in most cases, it's fairly obvious where the target really is. So let's look at the next one. Got number two, build good working relationships with colleagues. And as people have been saying, that's a collaboration skill probably. Uh, and it's because it says colleagues, it's probably at work. Yeah. 
and then follows golden rules, gold, follows school rules, golden agreements. This is where people agree to behave in a certain way at school. Uh, and that's really a, a, a social responsibilities uh, kind of area at primary. Uh, puts across a point of view persuasively, uh, really a, a communication kind of skill. And I think that's, this was really aimed at HE, higher education. Participates in pretend activities. Uh, has a kind. It could it could be pre-primary, uh, but I think the puppets thing makes it feel more pre-primary. Sorts and classifies classifies objects. Yeah, sometimes people um, debate this one quite a lot, but the intention was that it was really about critical thinking because part of critical thinking is being able to analyze things and to classify things and information. Okay, so those are the results, those are the answers. Now, one thing I want to mention is, uh, if you look on the screen, it often says competencies, but when I'm speaking, I often say skills, because skills is kind of the informal word we use in English. But strictly speaking, we should be calling them competencies. And that's because competency is the ability to do something well, and it involves different components to it. In fact, there are really three different components to competency. You need knowledge to be able to do it. You need the skill. Skill is what you get when you practice something so that you can do it well and fluently. And attitude is a way of thinking needed to develop that skill and knowledge. If you think, I don't know if any of you play the piano or play a musical instrument, you'll have a you, you will see a similar pattern that you need knowledge you need to be able to read music to know the notes but you need to keep practicing it so that you can play it well and you need a certain attitude which helps you motivates you to do that learning so it's the same with language it's the same with anything that we need to learn uh, in life so competency is the combination of these three areas now um We've produced a lot of information uh, about this for each of those areas. We've produced a booklet which explains them in more detail, gives you some examples of can-do statements, and you can get those from this website, cambridge.org slash CLCF. CLCF stands for Cambridge Life Competencies Framework. Those are all free downloadable PDFs. And there's a QR code if you have uh, a phone handy to, to get to it. Okay, the application of the framework. So what can we do with this framework? Well, we use it to develop curriculum, uh, to work out what needs to be taught in schools, to set learning objectives. We, we also use it within Cambridge University Press to design better learning materials, to design tasks which help develop these skills. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And we can also use it to some extent for assessment, not for formal exam assessment, but more for teachers to evaluate their students. Are, they, are my students developing critical thinking skills or not? And the can-do statements are a useful way to do that. But most importantly today, we're thinking about teaching. How can teachers use this framework to help develop these skills while they're teaching English? And that's what I'm going to talk about in more detail now. So the first thing you can do as a teacher is to notice existing opportunities to develop these skills. So when we're teaching English, especially when we're teaching English to communicate, there are actually a lot of opportunities to develop these skills. But we just need to think a bit more explicitly, and more clearly, more consciously about them. So let me give you some examples. And I'm going to give you examples. Some are from primary, some are for secondary, some are for adults and university students. But the principles are the same. And I hope you'll be able to see those principles uh, as I show you some of these examples. This example um, is a primary um, level activity. It comes from a, a Cambridge book called Superminds. Um, and what you can see is there's a, a task where the children have to ask questions to each other to collect information about their hobbies um, and they have to write down the answers and then they have to give a little bit of a presentation they create a bar chart and then they just say something to the to the other children in the class so what opportunities are there for developing those life competencies 
Well, we can see here there about there's obviously it's about managing communication, about taking turns in a conversation, but it's also about collecting that information, categorizing it, and producing a bar chart. And these are the early stages of developing critical thinking. And similarly, to be able to stand up at the front of the class and explain it to the rest of the class is developing that confidence in communication, communication skills. So these are all little activities which just can help us push along the development of those life competencies. So here I've listed out these are different things that you can use, that you can see are being developed in this type of activity. Here's another example. This is for university students and we can see this is a speaking task uh, and in some ways it looks quite straightforward but it's been designed to develop lots of other skills at the same time and this is a course called Unlock uh, for university students. And here they're, they're being asked to give a presentation about the invention or discovery that's changed our lives. And the first bit is thinking of inventions or discoveries that have changed our lives, creating this map. And there's, there's a little bit of creative thinking because they're having to bring their own ideas. The ideas are not given by the book or by the teacher. The students have to bring their own experience to the table. And then they have to analyze in what ways they make a change. So we've got a bit of creative and critical thinking happening in those first two activities. Whoops, sorry. Yeah. Oh. There. Then if you look at the task, how it develops, they discuss the research questions and they help each other answer the questions on ideas map. So they're collaborating together and they take turns to practice their presentation. And then they have to give each other feedback and there's a bit of guidance on the feedback. So this is about developing collaboration skills, but it's guided by the course book or by the teacher so that they are not just practicing collaboration, they're actually developing the skill of collaboration by learning how to give useful feedback and not just say, yeah, it was great or it was rubbish. And then there's the working in small groups. Again, um, this is practicing their communication skills, actually giving their presentations. So we can see in these set of activities, this lesson, there's a lot of life competency skills being developed uh, in a small way, but each of those small developments adds up over the year to developing the skill effectively. And then at the end of that uh, activity, they're asked to reflect on what they learned and how well they did it. And this is part of learning skills, learning to learn, is that reflecting on your learning. So all of this is helping them develop those. Here's another example. This is an activity uh, from Superminds, again, from primary school. Uh, yeah, primary school. And if we look here, it's interesting because it's a reading task on the surface, but it's also about developing critical thinking skills. So they're reading this little notice uh, at school board about a trip. And then on the right, there's a checklist. What's the important information you need to put in a notice about a school trip? And you can see there are six points there. And if we look at the example, we can see, yep, uh, where you're going, date, meeting point, meeting time, cost, return time. So this is a good school notice for a trip. Great. Then we give the students some examples of other notices which are not quite perfect. And the students need to work out what are the weaknesses? What are the thing information missing from these? So it is reading, it's about language skills. They are developing their language skills, but at the same time, they're developing their critical thinking skills, thinking about it, what information is needed, what's missing. So I don't know if you can work out how good your memory is, if you can remember this, the checklist from the previous slide, um, but let me, let me give you the answer. So in the first one, the blue one, that doesn't put a destination, there's no date, and there's no meeting time. And we can look at the other ones and identify the, uh, the, the weaknesses in those notices. So again, as I say, it's integrating the development of critical thinking at the same time as teaching the language skills. And that's really picking out the things that they were learning from that. Okay, if we also think about critical thinking, this, this is from a 
course called Evolve uh, for adults learning English. And it's about, it's a lesson which is on the topic of the way that adults look after pets and whether they go over the top in the way they look after pets. And then you look at these photos and you can see uh, these, are, these are good for starting a discussion on our relationship with pets. And but what is interesting is that they there's a discussion and it's a listening activity but while the students are having to practice their listening skills in English they're also developing their critical thinking skills because what the task asks them to do is to listen for examples and then in what ways do those examples support their arguments because one person is arguing that we do too much for for our pets and some saying we don't do enough and that it's okay so in those arguments this listening task is focusing on the use of examples and to think critically about how effective those examples are for the argument so again it's combining the development of language skills and the development of critical thinking at the same time Okay, the second thing that we can do as teachers is to encourage our students to reflect and to assess themselves in terms of their learning and developing of these skills. Um, so here is a, a primary sorry, course uh, where they have, to, they have a mission and it's like a project to set up a, a restaurant. And there's an element of creative thinking here. They have to prepare a, a sign. And then in groups, they have to talk with, their, with um, their other students about it. So it's communication, creative thinking. And I'm gonna move on a bit quickly here. Yeah. But part of a project is managing the sharing of tasks. So when you're doing a project, you have to help your students to manage the sharing of tasks. They need to learn that. And in some ways, what they have to do is they have to learn how to list the tasks, make sure everyone has a task, and say how good they were at doing it. Now, if you are in a, well, whether it's primary or secondary or adults, you could ask your students to self-evaluate. How well have they done that? So did everyone do something? Did you help anyone with their task? And how well did your team do? If all your students can answer those questions, you're helping them to reflect on their own collaboration skills. Let's take another example. This is about strategies for learning vocabulary and this comes uh, from uh, another course called Talent and here they there's a particular activity where the students pr produce spidergrams to help them learn the um, their vocabulary. It helps them to, to, to memorize it and see links. So that's a particular strategy but really what you can do as a teacher is to help them to develop their vocabulary learning strategies more generally. And then this, I've taken this example from a school where they gave their students this checklist at the beginning of the term, the semester, and asked the students to say how well they think they did these things. And then at the end of the year, they asked them to evaluate themselves again. Now, it doesn't really matter too much what the results of those evaluations are. The important thing is the students are thinking about it. They're thinking about what are my strategies for learning vocabulary. And here's another example. Uh, in this case, it's ground rules for discussions. Um, I've taken this, I'm going a bit fast now because I realize time is running short. Uh, this, this example, this is a school that wrote its own rules for so a class which wrote its own rules for discussions in the classroom to encourage uh, to encourage discussion in the classroom and if you've got time I recommend you go to this website school21.org.uk it's a British school which does a lot around developing life competencies life skills and particularly communication skills okay the third thing you can do is to extend activities that have an opportunity for developing life competencies. And here's an example here. This is creative thinking. So creative thinking partly involves responding imaginatively to pictures, music or ideas. And if you can find a really nice picture, in this case, I love this picture of a, of a girl after or before a birthday party, and she's got a very emotional <laughs> looking face. And I saw a teacher use this, and they asked the, all the students to imagine that they're the girl in the picture, to think what's their name 
and to think what's happening, what do they feel, what's going to happen next, what do you want to happen? And what I like about this activity is that it's practicing English and these questions have no right answer. You can't say to anybody, that's the wrong answer. It's just about imagination and creative thinking. But at the same time, they're practicing their language skills. Here's another example. In fact, I think it's from the same lesson. The teacher was planning, asked the students to plan a birthday party and asked them to think about the five senses. Could they imagine the party? What could they see or hear or taste or feel or smell? And these are just uh, ways of trying to bring out their imagination. Learning to learn. Nowadays, it's quite common in course books to have a checklist at the end of a unit or a lesson about how, what have I learned? Have I learned this? Have I learned that? And this is really good. It's a, a useful way of reflecting on your learning. Um, but the only slight problem with this is that it's easy for students just to tick the boxes without thinking. So now in our courses, again, this is a, this is a course called Evolve for Adults. They've added an extra section called Prove It. So you can tick the box, but then you have to prove it by doing these quick tasks. And I think that's another way of just helping students to reflect more carefully on their learning. And this is a, a, another example here. There's a discussion, pair work, working together. Is there a way that you can develop this discussion so that it's developing their ability to work collaboratively uh, with each other? So one of the things about collaboration is um, listening respectfully and responding constructively to others' contributions. So if we think about this within a language lesson, we might think about what is the language we can use to do this? So let's, let's think about this more carefully. One of the things you do when you're responding constructively is that you build on others' ideas. You acknowledge other points of view, you suggest alternatives, and you politely interrupt when short of time. So these are the kind of sub-skills you need. And then what language can you use when you are doing this? So if you're building on someone else's ideas, you might have phrases like, yes, and another thing is, and yes, that's true, and I also think, or acknowledge other points of view. I'm going to go through a bit more quickly now because the time's short, but you can see here, you're thinking about the phrases that are useful for people to do these skills. And by teaching these phrases, you're teaching English language, but you're also teaching them how to respond constructively to others' contributions. So if we had a lot of time, I would ask you to, uh, to think about these phrases and to use them in a practice discussion. And I had a practice topic of teachers will be replaced by robots in the future, discuss. But because of shorter time and because we're online and there's 3,000 of you, uh, I'm, I'm not going to start that discussion. But I, hopefully we'll be sharing these slides with you afterwards and then you can try this with your own colleagues. Just a couple of minutes left, Ben. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. No, I really come to the end now. Uh, the last point, last point is you have to be selective. You can't do everything. Just a quick point here. Do you know, does anybody know where this is? This is a map of London. And if you, got, if you were visiting London, you got this tourist map which says, here are 20 places to visit, and you only had two days, you wouldn't panic and say, oh my God, I've got to see 20 places in two days. You would say, I've got two days, I can see four places, which are the most important four places. And so in a way, the, the life competencies is the same thing. The life competency framework is a map of all the skills that we could teach our students. But we don't have time to do everything. So we need to decide how much time have we got and what the most important things for my students, for our own students. So that's what you need to prioritize, the skills that are the most important. Okay, if we had more time, I would ask you to reflect on these questions. But I think we're gonna uh, finish now so that you've got time to ask any questions. So I'm going to, go to the question and answers and see if there are any questions. Is that how, Peter, how do you want to do it? Should I read the questions? I've picked up some questions, uh, Ben. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you the questions if I may. Yep. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, really a very big thank you, Ben. Um, phenomenal uh, webinar. The comments in the chat box have been uh, absolutely amazing. 
uh, so, so thanks very much. Um, I'm sorry I can't um, ask Ben all of your questions, but I've picked up a couple uh, which hopefully will be useful for everybody. Uh, ben, this, this came up quite early on in your uh, presentation. Uh, somebody said, well, if we don't know what's coming in the future, for example, if we don't know what jobs are coming up in the future, how can we actually prepare our students for what we don't know about? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and in some ways, that's really what I, uh, what we've been trying to do is to analyse, even though jobs change, there are certain aspects of all jobs that we all need. And that's why we were looking at research across the US, across Europe. What are the common features across all jobs, even new and old jobs? And some of them are those those skills like communication, collaboration, critical thinking, whatever your job is, whether you're a blogger or a, um, uh, if you're a 3D food printer chef, um, you need these skills to some extent to, in different ways. So that, that's why we're really focusing on let's help our students develop these general skills so whatever their job they can yeah. u make use of them. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, another question which came up um, about midway through, uh, somebody was asking it, whether or not you believe that uh, learning a language, learning a, a second or a third language is essential within education if, if we want students to be successful in the future. Absolutely. I think this, this is so important. And, uh, you know, we're talking here about English language learning because uh, it's an English language learning context. But really, we're talking about multilingualism, yes. that people need to be able to learn different languages to communicate uh, with others, because it, we're talking about international citizens that need to be able to communicate with other languages. So 100% it's about multilingualism. Okay. And uh, I think we've got time probably for one more question. Um, uh, somebody was asking how can we, they actually use the word assess but I, I think they probably meant um, evaluate or gauge maybe um, mm. how can we um, assess that's the word they use the different life skills across the development stages so as as children you know move from kg to primary and secondary how can we actually gauge um, the development yeah. of, of life skills yeah, I mean, it's a very difficult one to answer, but uh, what I've seen, uh, I've seen at one school, um, which I thought was a good approach, was they looked at the can-do statements that are in our booklets, and, and you can see those, they're, they're public, and they adapted them for their context. So they looked at the can-do statements which describe behaviours, so uh, is able to interrupt with politely when someone else is talking, um, and they adapted their context some of them are not relevant some of them were okay some of them they needed to revise them and they produced like a checklist uh, like a rubric um, I'm not sure what term you use but descriptions of behavior and then they asked uh, teachers just at the end of the um, term just to to do a quick yes 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 uh, well actually they did yes half maybe or no and um, they just created a kind of point system on that, which they used just, it's not a real evaluation, but just to get a, a rough measure of how well their students are doing uh, right. on, the, on the important things. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Ben. I think that's all we've got time for. My pleasure. Um, Thank you very much for listening, everybody.